Moonshine and Appalachia have long been synonymous with one another. The image of the woodsy mountaineer with his jug of moonshine is not uncommon in American culture. What would surprise many, however, is that the production and distribution of illegal liquor dates back far longer than the idea of Appalachia as a region, which was popularized by missionaries and William Goodall Frost in the years following Reconstruction. So how did moonshine begin, and how has its cultural standing evolved through the years? According to scholars Emily K. Pine and Kai A. Shaft, illegal liquor was a response by the Irish to Parliament's excise tax on liquor to quell tensions between King James and Northern Ireland. Eventually, the Scotch-Irish moved to the New World because of economic strife and brought their liquor-making traditions with them. Once in America, many Scotch-Irish settlers moved into the Appalachian region to avoid government laws similar to what they left behind in Europe. In 1791, the U.S. government imposed a federal excise tax on stills and distilled spirits. Even so, illegal liquor still found a fertile market in America prior to the prohibition of the 1920s, as many states began outlawing the sale of liquor, and moonshine made its way as far north as Chicago and New York. Literary critic Matthew Kelly argues that the Volstead Act had a loophole for homemade liquors. Section 29 permitted the homemade production of non-intoxicating cider and fruit juice, which meant that homemade wine below 0.5% alcohol by volume was allowed. This technically likely contributed to the trend of hiding moonshine in fruit drinks or ciders. Moonshine was often stored in a cider jug and the juice-colored camouflage quelled suspicion and made the liquor easier to drink. Later, this iteration of moonshine became known as apple pie moonshine or applejack. This seems like a lot of trouble to go to for a little liquor, but the process of making moonshine is actually highly involved and demanding. According to journalist Ed Grabanowski, the process of making moonshine is as follows. First, cornmeal is soaked in hot water and mixed with yeast to start the fermentation process. The mixture, which is called mash, is heated in a copper still because of copper's ability to conduct heat but not leach into the alcohol. As the mash heats up, pressure builds and the alcohol steam is guided through the cap arm. Sometimes, to make a stronger moonshine, shiners will re-evaporate the alcohol before continuing the process. The steam then travels into the worm, a coiled pipe that winds down inside of the worm box. There, the moonshine is cooled and subsequently condensed into a liquid. The liquid is fed through a spout that typically filters it one last time, and then it is ready to be bottled and sold. According to food writer Ronnie Lundy, sorghum was another option for making moonshine as it grew more quickly and was less trouble than corn. But for many families in Appalachia, corn was the staple ingredient. Such was the case for Sarah and Charles, who both grew up in Grundy, Virginia, and families that made moonshine. Charles even helped his grandfather in the process and recalls his first experience with moonshine. I was raised by my grandparents, and my granddad actually did moonshining. In fact, I sat up many a night and helped him run off um, a lot of moonshine. The first time it happened, I was young, and uh, I remember it was during the summer, and we put in the biggest corn crop I could ever imagine. Uh, and we stood on the side of a mountain and I had to go up there and hoe the corn, you know, get the weeds out and everything. And I could not figure out why we were raising so much corn. Well, uh, sort of toward the end of the season, I noticed that my grandfather started locking the, the basement, uh, which had always been unlocked. One day he left it unlocked and I walked in and there were all these barrels and with this sort of foul-smelling stuff in it, I couldn't. And that's when I realized he's getting ready to make moonshine. And he had his, he had a still, and he hid out in the mountains. And so he would go get the still, bring it in, set it up in our basement, and for several nights, we would run off moonshine. And of course, a still, of course, you'd, you'd put it in there. He'd set it up with it's called mash in the in the barrels, but then you have to distill it. Um, and he would put it in there into the fire, and of course, it would. It would cause it to steam, and then he would use that to uh, cool it back down as it came out, what they call the worm, I guess. I don't remember all of it exactly, but uh, he would make you know, several gallons of moonshine. When he got through, uh, he would take the still, put it back out the mountain. He did this several times, and the last time he got ready to go do it, he went up and somebody had stolen his still, and he was quite angry, but that was the last time he, he made no more moonshine after that. Some people died from it if it was not made properly. Uh, they would take old car radiators and run it through it because of the copper in it. And, and if it was not cleaned out properly, and somehow they used carbide in it to, to, to work it. And if they didn't do it right, there were a lot of people who got sick and died if it was not done properly. 
Interestingly, moonshine is responsible for the development of racing culture in America. Moonshiners took Ford cars from the 1920s to the late 1930s, they modified them greatly, and then they ran them much faster than anything else on the road in order to distribute the liquor that they carried. It actually was what NASCAR came out of. Uh, all of these people would have these souped up cars because they have to run from the law. The law began chasing them. There was an old movie called Thunder Road that's a great depiction of what went on. Uh, and, and they would chase, the, the police would chase them. Of course, they had to have the power to get away. And of course, they would have the moonshine in their trunk. And it was sort of from that, it was from that that, that the racing, what we call professional racing that we have today, uh, came out of. People would, would race their cars and eventually, you know, NASCAR was born. It had its roots back in the, uh, in the moonshining days. Representations of moonshine in popular culture tend to be far more one-dimensional than the reality of moonshine. In 1899, William Goodell Frost published Our Contemporary Ancestors in the Southern Mountains, an essay which popularized negative stereotypes that are still associated with Appalachia today. Frost painted Appalachians as backwards, illiterate, and violent to the point of being homicidal, and lumped moonshining in with these stereotypes. Thus, the idea of the poor, violent mountaineer who made moonshine rather than honest living was widely distributed to readers of the Atlantic Monthly. John Fox Jr., in his 1908 local color novel, The Trail of the Lonesome Pine, applied this stereotype to characters within the Tolliver family. Dave spends much of his time in liquor houses, and June frets that any stranger in town is an authority figure coming to disrupt her family still. Additionally, June's father, Devil Judd Tolliver, is portrayed as a quintessential mountaineer bushy beard and feuding included, and he makes moonshine. Later literature treats moonshiners somewhat more favorably. Julia Frank's 2016 novel, Over the Plain Houses, is set in the 1930s and features a sympathetic moonshiner. Leslie is one of the main people to show sympathy and care for his cousin Irene in the book, though he is still criticized for his craft by those around him. Some consider moonshiners to be gentlemen criminals due to beliefs that excise taxes on alcohol are unfair. Others still find economic sympathy with moonshiners seeking to supplement their income through liquor. Sydney Sailor Farr, in her Appalachian cookbook, More Than Moonshine, recalls that her father, her brothers, and grandfathers all made moonshine whiskey, primarily to sell for cash, and that they could make more money selling moonshine whiskey than any other way. It is important to note, however, that moonshine was not universally favorable to those making it. My dad used to make moonshine. And I came from a large family. There were 11 children in the family. And my dad kept his still in, uh, in the mountains at the back of the house. And there's, there were times that, that I think my dad, it bothered him to make it because I think sometimes he might have sold it. I know he bartered a lot with it. He would trade to get things for it. And my oldest brother wasn't very old at the time. He, he wanted to go with Dad out to make the moonshine. And Dad told him no, that it was snowing, he couldn't do it. And my oldest brother looked at him and said, but I'll follow right in your footsteps. And when he said that, my dad never made any moonshine afterwards. Television offers a new lens through which to view moonshiners. A 2009 episode of the popular cartoon sitcom The Simpsons featured moonshining in its plot. Entitled Rednecks and Broomsticks, the episode features a character named Cletus, who is essentially an amalgamation of stereotypes. He owns a lot of guns, lives in a cabin, has a lot of children, is unintelligent, and of course makes moonshine. The reoccurring main character, Homer Simpson, drinks some of the moonshine and claims to taste elderberry, tobacco, poison oak, and hints of game in the moonshine. This is an obvious jab at the poorer moonshiner's lifestyle and diet. Some television shows take a documentary-style approach to moonshine, such as the wildly popular Discovery Channel program Moonshiners. The description of the show on its webpage reads, Every spring, a fearless group of men and women venture deep into the woods of Appalachia, defying the law, rivals, and nature itself to keep the centuries-old tradition of craft whiskey alive. The show stages moonshining as a way of preserving customs and traditions, but also features moonshiners evading authorities and distributing their product. 
Although shiners in the show often have a family history of moonshining, most also rely on its production for their income. There is a certain degree of irony to this program as it essentially commodifies an illegal product and turns the lives of moonshiners into a spectacle for viewers to ogle. In this case, the producers control the narrative of the moonshiners. Furthermore, specialty shops such as Old Smoky in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, sell a variety of flavor moonshines, turning moonshine into a commercial product for the general public. The rise of craft moonshine breweries such as Howling Moon Distillery and brands of moonshine like Troy and Sons speak to the transition of moonshine from a homebrew practice to an upscale, quirky beverage, but at the cost of authenticity and understanding of the practice's roots. Moonshine does crop up in local cookbooks, but even though recipes list ingredients, they often neglect to mention distillation steps or still setup instructions. This speaks to perhaps an assumption by contributors to community cookbooks that people in their community are already aware of how to make or acquire moonshine. The Deep South Cookbook by Southern Living Progressive Farmer includes a recipe for moonshine whiskey that doesn't actually use any moonshine, but instead calls for bourbon which may be an acknowledgement of the difficulty of obtaining moonshine if the cook doesn't already know someone who makes it or cannot purchase it. Recipes, Remedies, and Rumors by the Cades Cove Preservation Association has the moonshine recipe by Dave Staley that has no mention of a still or even specific directions of what to do with the ingredients listed. Thus, this recipe would make sense only to someone who's already familiar with moonshine. Old Timey Recipes, collected by Phyllis Connor, gives a detailed explanation of how to make moonshine, but again lacks instructions on making a still. Some recipes and references include jokes, such as, there are many ways of making moonshine, this is just one way. For other ways, check with your nearest revenuer. Humorous recipes seem to indicate that moonshiners don't always take themselves too seriously. Jokes can also help them skirt around the illegality of what they're doing. After all, as one cookbook says, this occupation is against the law, but there's no law that prohibits know-how, so here's how. Overall, the representation of moonshine in cookbooks seems to support the insular nature of the craft. Unless the reader already knows most of the process, or a moonshiner, these recipes provide little help for getting started. The internal and external cultures of moonshine are widely different, and representations of moonshine in literature and cookbooks support this assumption. Media produced by people outside of moonshine culture tend to be negative or fail to encapsulate the variety of opinions on moonshine held by moonshiners themselves. Comparatively, when moonshine is discussed by those familiar with the craft, it becomes clear that not all moonshiners love moonshine, but also that authors assumed an innate knowledge about the craft in their reader when writing about it. One thing is clear, however, and that's that moonshine isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Whether moonshiners base their production in heritage, economics, or just because, the legacy of moonshine is proof that Appalachia and its food are subjected to external forces that can preserve or demean its unique culture, sometimes doing both at once. Thus, there is no singular moonshine narrative, but continued interest in the craft opens the possibility for a more nuanced understanding of its history and future.